Welcome, um, everybody, um, uh, to this webinar um, on community engagement in MHPSS, examples from the Rohingya refugee response in Bangladesh. Um, since we've got a slightly longer webinar than usual, we'll be running to 90 minutes uh, rather than the usual 60 because uh, we have a larger number of presenters than usual. I think it's best that we just get started uh, right on time. We hope that um, we've had a, uh, an exceptional response to, the, uh, to the, the, the webinar flyer. We've had more than, I think, more than 250 um, people register for the webinar. We hope that many of them will, will join us. Uh, we have just hit 80 people in the room right now, uh, but I think we'll get, get started. Um, I'd like to say that this is a particularly exciting session for image.net to feature. Um, because we're featuring in this webinar uh, quite a significant contribution to the field, um, namely that's um, content from a special bumper uh, issue of the International Journal Intervention that was published just last November um, 2019 with uh, 28 articles that are dedicated to the topic of mental health and psychosocial well-being of uh, Rohingya refugees. Hi, 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 everyone. Um, it seems Hello, Hello, can you hear me? Great. Um, can I ask you at what point you stopped being able to hear me? Was I introducing um, Mohammed? Okay, maybe maybe I shall just start. Okay, I will perhaps, uh, but okay, uh, let, okay. Thanks very much for the, the feedback. Let me start again and please signal if um, the audio becomes an issue again. We will try and sort it out as soon as possible. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna introduce again the presenters. Um, for the session today, and, uh, and uh, running slightly longer than usual because we have um, four different presenters. We are going to start off with um, an introduction to the special issue from Mohammed El Shazli, who is a consultant psychiatrist uh, from Egypt, who has over 40, 15 years of experience in in, uh, in diverse. Uh, humanitarian and refugee context. And he has been working in Cox's Bazaar, um, Bangladesh, since February uh, 2018, MHPSS officer with UNHCR. And in that role, he has been uh, responsible for mainstreaming mental health interventions within the humanitarian response, particularly in the health and protection sector. And also with the strengthening of community-based mental health initiatives and scaling up uh, brief psychological interventions. I hope you got that bit. 
Um, great, thanks. Um, what we're going to have right after after Muhammad is a presentation from Salik Ahmed, who is a psychologist who's been working with IOM um, in Cox's Bazaar since um, September 2018. And Salik is a psychologist by training um, with more than eight years of experience in uh, community-based service provision and capacity building in various areas of Bangladesh. Uh, and his responsibilities with IOM are also to do with implementing community-based MHPSS in coordination with other sectoral programming approaches, uh, with uh, integration of MHPSS, and also with scaling up uh, psychological interventions. And he is going to be speaking with us today about IOM's work in providing safe social spaces for refugees in Cox's Bazaar. After Salik, uh, we'll be hearing from Shahe uh, uh, Ibrahim, who is a uh, humanitarian professional with over 10 years of experience in the field of uh, protection and gender-based violence in both emergency and adversity settings in um, uh, the African and Asian continents. And she will be drawing on her experience um, of leading the Dan Church Aid GBVN uh, protection programs for Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazaar to talk about the role of psychosocial support in coping with GBV with this particular population. And last but certainly not least, we will have a presentation from uh, Mahmoudul Alam, a psychologist from Bangladesh who has more than 12 years of experience in clinical services, capacity building activities, and humanitarian MHPSS response. Um, and uh, Mahmoudul is currently working with uh, UNHCR as a protection uh, associate, and his work focuses on strengthening the referral and coordination um, amongst uh, MHPSS actors and also other, others at field level, and in uh, enhancing the capacity and supervision of psychologists and community psychosocial volunteers. And it's this last category that he'll be working on, uh, he'll be focusing on for his presentation today, um, discussing the role of these community psychosocial volunteers in, in the MHPSS response. And, and before I hand over to Mohammed, I would just like to say a, a word of thanks uh, to the team at Intervention for putting this webinar together, uh, particularly the editor-in-chief Wendy Ager and some of the guest editors of the special issue. Um, uh, to give you some full, uh, for full disclosure, I also serve on the board of Intervention, and I'm uh, particularly pleased to see a collaboration between two platforms in the field that are very close to my heart. And I hope that this is just the first of very many occasions for them to to work together. But let's let's get on with the webinar. Um, and uh, I invite Mohammed to take on uh, to come online and, and kick it off. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ananda. Thanks a lot for, for this introduction, and thanks everyone from uh, moderators and the participants as well. It's uh, it's a great opportunity and uh, uh, to present about this special issue of the Journal of Intervention and having this wide representation of MHPSS people from everywhere. So uh, just to let you know, I'm joining here from the same laptop together with my colleagues Mahmoud and Salik. We are using the same account, which you could see Cook's Bazaar team. So in case of you just uh, uh, would like me to, of course, to, to pass some questions after the presentation. Um, first, the Journal of Intervention, this is a special issue, as just Sanda highlighted, uh, um, it, it contains 28 articles, nine peer-reviewed research articles, and six are focusing on the response in Bangladesh and three in Malaysia. And also, it uh, includes 14 peer reviewed field reports, seven of them about the MHPSS work that we do here in Cox Bazaar in Bangladesh, focusing on issues related to coordination and communication uh, in the field among different organizations, also with some reports from Australia. And it includes as well some very valuable personal reflections from the humanitarian workers involved with the mental health uh, uh, programs for, for the Rohingya population here. Um, uh, this I, I have I have to to, to say this uh, this intervention uh, special issue was uh, co-funded by uh, WHO, UNHCR, and IOM offices here. So thanks for the three organization for giving the opportunity to uh, share the knowledge widely. And I would encourage you uh, all the participants to go and check it online and open access journal. It includes a lot of interesting. 
material for you. So hopefully you enjoyed the reading. I guess colleagues from MHPs.net, they will provide the link to the special issue together with the recording. Um, I will start with um, uh, a brief uh, presentation about the challenges and opportunities for the Rohingya uh, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Programming, actually, which is the title of the field report that I co-authored with a group of uh, colleagues. Thanks for them, for those who are present and those who are absent from uh, this webinar. Um, indeed, the, the, uh, the, the context here is important, and starting with it will help us to understand and put these challenges in, in uh, in a way that we how we relate them to the design and the implementation of energy basis programs. Over the last 50 years, we had several several waves of displacement and repatriation of Rohingya refugees um, or forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals between Myanmar and Bangladesh. The most recent one has started in August 2017, where we had more than 700 southern Rohingyas crossing from Myanmar to Bangladesh. And they reside in two mega uh, refugee settlements, namely Kotobolonga and Ayapara. And just for you to imagine this, over a period of almost like three months, on average, we would receive daily around 5,000 people on average crossing every day from Myanmar to Bangladesh, to, uh, to uh, the territory of Cox Bazar town, uh, residing in these areas, taking bamboo trees, making their own shelters, staying there over a period of almost like three months. The total number now is estimated to be around 1.1 million Rohingya refugees. They are mainly in these two refugee settlements, but some of them are as well, uh, they are scattered in, uh, within, uh, with the host community. Uh, when we look at um, the MHPSS needs and uh, the major stressors faced by them, we broadly can categorize them into three broad categories. The first one is, of course, the past experience. They went through unprecedented experience of violence, killing and torture and sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, the, the daily stressor of the, of the camp life which includes the overcrowded and the congested living condition, the lack of access to services, especially education for children, and the limited livelihood opportunities, and also the existing tension between the refugees and the host communities. Also, there is lack of certainty about the future, which is very distressing for uh, refugees here. Maybe the always question where they we uh, repatriate back to Myanmar or relocated to the island of Shingar, in the Bain Bengal, and lack of clarity about this would be uh, uh, is is considered as a, as a major major risk factor for them. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just checking the chat room. If there is an issue with uh, with connection or hearing me, just please let me know. Or let me uh, check with my colleagues here so I can, uh, we can double check. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks, Marjo. Um, some of the challenges um, uh, that we face um, uh, with, with the image basis programming here um, are, are included in more details, of course, in the field report that uh, you, 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 could, uh, you can find online, you can check it. But I will highlight quickly some of the points here. The first one, of course, is the language and communication barrier. And the, the Rohingya language is, um, is unique in that it does not have any written script. Which which some which makes the, the documentation and the development of psychometric tools, for example, very very challenging. Uh, the illiteracy rate is is very high, which means the majority of the population they speak only their language. The language is somehow close to Ashtagonian dialect from the Bengali language, but still with an overlap that may not exceed seventy five percent. So we have like around in, in, in best case scenario, we have 25% gap of communication. In, in reality, actually, it's more than this because not all the staff who provide the, uh, or work in refugee camps 
they are from Shitagong, they are maybe from other areas from Bangladesh, and still they have this this problem in communicating with with uh, with uh, refugees. And when we have issues related to the language and communication, these issues are specifically critical when it comes to mental health and psychosocial support programming, where communication with with uh, with uh, with refugees is is very very important and crucial to it. Um, the second one, of course, is related to uh, the cultural factors. For example, the community perception of mental health, mental illness, and mental health services. Um, the, the 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 concept itself of mental health is not is not very uh, very common to most of refugees. I, I would say even the access to general health service was very very limited back there in Myanmar. So when we we speak about um, uh, a mental health service, it's something that um, the majority of them never had experience with it, and um, uh, how how they perceive issues related to mental health, how they perceive mental illness, and how they perceive the mental health service is always an issue that needs very careful exploration during the design and implementation of our programs. Uh, we have the monsoon-related events, and if you are familiar with the context here in Bangladesh. We have the rainy season and the monsoon, which spans almost like six months out of the 12 months. And it has its own challenge and, and, and on, on, the, on the living conditions. Heavy rain with a company like uh, landslides, loss of lives and properties, which, which is a continuous stress for, for people there. Also, we have the tension between refugees and host community. There is, uh, and the, this tension actually is progressively increasing and uh, leads to competition for the existing resources and uh, the standards of service to refugees that sometimes go beyond the standard for the host community. Also, we have challenges related to human resources, which uh, um, uh, mainly is lack of trained, of trained human resources, especially uh, uh, mental health professionals here in, in, in Bangladesh. A uh, smaller number of uh, specialized professions. For example, we have only one psychiatrist working in the government, and he is responsible for uh, the host community and uh, uh, refugees. So, this one psychiatrist, I, I guess he's the most overwhelming psychiatrist worldwide. He is responsible for 3.5 million people. Um, we have a chance related to the coordination of mental health service, for example, fragmentation of the coordination platforms. You could see MHPSS is fragmented between an MHPSS working group. There are some other subgroups under different sectors or subsectors that look into the MHPSS. And there is the National, of course, Mental Health Task Force. And there is the field level coordination. And uh, the last one, but not the least, is lack of specialized mental health services, especially for people with uh, specialized or severe mental health conditions. Um, quickly, some of uh, the opportunities here, or some of the directions that we would see um, uh, uh, could help to address these challenges is how we strengthen community-based mental health and psychosocial interventions. An example, my, my colleague Mahmoud will, will speak about community psychosocial volunteers, uh, which, which is, a, is a way of how we address uh, uh, the gap in terms of uh, the, the cultural barrier, the language barrier, and also the human resources. Uh, a possible opportunity as well in the integration of MHPSs into different sectors activity. And here, I, 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 I mean um, um, going beyond just the integration of mental health and primary health care, but looking into opportunities for integration into uh, protection sector and the subsectors as well. Also, um, uh, scalable psychological intervention, which is an opportunity for how we can provide uh, uh, mental, uh, psycho, mental health and psychosocial support services through non-specialized professionals, through training uh, and supervision, and also um, looking at the coordination of mental health and psychosocial support services. There is one, one, one article we published in Journal Intervention about introduction um, uh, of a field-level coordination where uh, we think in larger scale emergency, like the one here we have in Bangladesh, it's very important to introduce this level of coordination to make sure that uh, we link with the community on the ground and we, um, uh, we include traditional healers and religious leaders. And as well, 
we make sure that the communication uh, at the national and at the district and the field level is going uh, smooth among different partners and getting a bit independent from the humanitarian architecture now. Um, that's it for now. Thanks a lot. And um, I, uh, our um, dear moderators, if, if this is OK, I will uh, move now to my colleague Salik for his presentation. Just let me know if this is OK. Yes, please do. Um... Okay, Ananda. So I'm introducing my colleague Salik. He's sitting next to me, so we'll just we exchange uh, the seats now. Uh, uh, Salik is um, no. I think we need to no to to change the presentation. Um, Ananda, Give us I think moment. we need to change. Okay, yes. so I will give me one Salik. second. Sure, sure. I, so um, my, my colleague Salik, he, is, he works for IOM and as already Ananda uh, introduced him, and he will speak today briefly about um, uh, the rituals, the ritual ceremonies and how they can be part of MHPSS programs, which is an interesting area. There is a, an article published in the Journal of Intervention about this by our colleague uh, Olga, who work, have had worked with us here in Cox Bazar for a long time, but currently she is with IOM in Nigeria. We wish her good luck and say greetings to her from Cox Bazar. We are starting in seconds. Ready? Yeah. Go. <coughs> change the slide. Give us just one second. It's just being posted. We are ready when you are. Mohammed, just um, we can start with Mohammed. That's fine. Would you mind just responding briefly to a question that we've had um, on the um, on the chat because we had a small issue with uh, with Salik's presentation. But uh, just while we're doing that, there's a question for you in the chat. If you don't mind responding, okay, sure, okay. The presentation. Okay, so let me check the chat room. Yes, I, I can see a question from Sirar. This one, yes. Uh, Sirar, you're asking about, interested to learn more about integration of MHPSS into other sectors. How do this like in your setting? Well, first, uh, um, hi, Sirar, and thanks for being here. Um, I think, well, it's it's not a very straightforward and easy or easy thing. The, the integration, uh, well, so I will complete the response here, then Sari can start. Um, uh, the integration actually, in order to be effective, it needs to move across phases. So, for example, with with the child protection, with the child protection sector, we had to work a lot on the capacity building of the child protection actors in order to prepare them to include MHPSS in the basic vector of services to them, uh, and to establish referral pathway, effective and functional referral pathways between the child protection and other teams who are providing more of the general MHPSS service. The same we did with gender-based uh, uh, violence case management teams, for example, and when they work in their community centers or women empowerment spaces. Um, uh, I think this is at the level, the capacity building level, which of course needs a lot of training and ongoing supervision and stuff. But I think what's very important here that we managed to do is to introduce some MHPSS indicators into other sectors' activities so they can track and report on MHPSS issues, which is still very important 
and sometimes overlooked in most of the talks. I can elaborate more, but maybe when it comes to question and answer session, but now I'll give the floor to my colleague, Saleh. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Welcome, you, Saleh. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and welcome from, uh, uh, my name is Mohammed Saleh Ahmed and I'm working as uh, IOM, uh, as a MSPSS Field Operation Officers. Uh, now I'm going to present uh, about an article which is written by the Olga, my previous uh, supervisors, regarding the ritual and healing ceremonies to help to promote the psychosocial well-being, increasing sense of identity and community in Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Okay. Through my presentation, I would like to highlight some key points uh, regarding the healing ceremonies, such as the rationale of this program and uh, how the program is designed and the structure of the healing ceremony, the objective of the healing ceremony on what is the impact healing ceremony on the Rohingya community. So the healing ceremony is one of the uh, MSPSS, community-based MSPSS activities uh, implemented by the IOM. It's actually a giving a space to the Rohingya community where the people can feel safe, they can share their uh, sufferings, they can share their uh, negative feelings, as well as they can maintain their cultural lives, including the religious activities. So in the rationals, I'd like to share that the, the Rohingya community uh, before coming to Bangladesh and refugee camp, uh, they have faced a lot of restrictions regarding the practice of the cultural life, including the religious uh, uh, activities. For example, the mosque was closed and the uh, social gathering was strongly prohibited. And uh, we also find some uh, uh, in our assessments, like the, in terms of the community mental health need uh, identified, that the stateless conditions, the uncertainty uh, of their future and uh, discrimination and uh, persecutions. Uh, as the key factors of the, their affecting their mental health and well-beings. And uh, in our research, actually, the rapid assessment that around 60% participants say that the statelessness conditions actually hampered their mental health uh, very negatively. And the denial of the basic uh, identity rights, we also found uh, it's destroyed, actually, their social skills. So all of these factors are uh, linked with uh, their negative mental health and psychosocial well-being and to recover this all those factors uh, the IOM designed a program called the healing ceremony as a safe space where the people can reconnect their memories as an ethnic groups um, Okay, the aim of the healing ceremony actually to promote the healing from the collective wounds, uh, which is occurred by the caused by the, the experience of the discriminations and the uh, denial of the basic right identity rights. And uh, there are another objectives of this healing ceremony is to foster the community cohesion uh, by strengthening the community existing resources, the strength and the resilience responses. Now I'm going to discuss about the about the uh, how the healing ceremony or the social safe space uh, uh, is uh, safe space is designed and also the formed the firstly we conducted uh, a reassessment and we found uh, we not only identify the MSPSS problem in this assessment so we also try to identify some the existing coping mechanism some of the capacities they have the strength and the resources they have, the resilience responses. So we find um, many others, and uh, among them, so we find that the playing, uh, music, art are playing a very active role and as a, their coping mechanism. And they are able to deal with the uh, diverse uh, adversity situations. Then we'll do the DEX review, we do some uh, documents uh, research, and we also find the similar findings from this. Uh, uh, documents review. For example, I want to mention one of the research, uh, like which is contact with the Parjana in 2011. Uh, she also mentioned in her research that the music and songs have a, 
a form of informal uh, resistance to keep their memories alive, uh, to transmit the history from generation to generation by uh, through the visual and verbal expressions, and to communicate the informations about themselves to the others. And we do the another community consultations with the design of the healing ceremony with community people to know about the feedbacks. And based on the feedbacks, uh, we developed these healing ceremonies and the healing ceremonies are structured and ready for the implementations. Now I'm going to discuss about the healing ceremonies structure. Previous. Uh, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, this is the ceremony is by uh, we conducted in bi-weekly basis. It's a two-hour session, and the maximum uh, participant of this session is twenty. And the session is started with uh, a questions uh, like, "Who are we?" Through these questions, we will try to identify and try, we are assisting the beneficiaries to identify their own resource, their own capacities, and their role in the community as an individual, as a community persons. The session is actually divided into three parts. And the first part, we discuss about the music. And second part, we discuss about the art and painting. And third, we try to identify the symbol of the strength. In the uh, first sessions, the music, Uh, in the music, uh, as you know, the the oral traditions among the Rohingya community is expressed through the poems and songs. The Tarana songs is one of the famous songs in the Rohingya community, which is related to their emotions like the frustration, melancholy, uh, disappear, and the fear. And the song is the, actually the the medium to keep their communities alive, uh, and. Uh, you can see the pictures that uh, they are saying they are uh, they are uh, sharing their sorrows, they are sharing their pains, that they are sharing their feelings through the music. At the same time, uh, we also do some activities with the kids uh, to maintain the community, so that the kids can learn their the music like the Ola song and the kids song. So this is the actually the community's identity. So identity. The second session actually regarding the art and paintings. Actually, beneficiary were told to share their histories through their art and paintings. Uh, you know, uh, then the first pictures that you saw that it is drawn by a, a girl, a 14 years girl. So she maintained actually, she told her histories through this drawing that she is kept in the house and she was not allowed to go outside and her life is in the house actually. And the second pictures, we can say that uh, the, a woman draw his dream actually in the pillow cover, the dream garden actually maintains uh, these things. And the third pictures, we, we can say that uh, a boy who is 12 years old uh, has a dream to back his own country, own land with using this imaginary part. Actually, we collected uh, the different uh, the cultural items and the collecting memories through this art and painting, which are integrated with the collect, uh, collective uh, memory component to promote the community identity and to save them in for future, actually. So in third session, uh, we're trying to identify the, the symbol of his strength. Uh, in these sessions, actually, we are focused on increasing the awareness uh, of the social collective network. And based on the first two sessions, we receive some stories. And we, the facilitators, help uh, the, the beneficiary to reconnect the stories, uh, the connections, to create connection between the stories. Uh, one of the uh, 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 quotations we uh, find in our during the session that uh, one of the main persons said that our strength is that we can take our home with us like a boat. 
So it means that the community has the capacity to preserve their home, preserve their uh, identity as a community. It restored their sense of the community and feel connected and united again. So another comments actually comes from a adolescent girl. Mm -hmm. So when put our hands together and we can paint be, uh, beautiful patterns with the hand, I feel we are very strong women and we are not alone. So actually the community has the right to choose their uh, symbol of strength. They choose the symbol of uh, the culture which uh, represent their unity, which represent their resources. So through this way, we try to identify the symbol of strength. And after this, we also do a Okay. So we also try to identify the impact of the healing ceremony. So to see the impact of the healing ceremony, we developed a evaluation systems, including the focus group discussions. So we conducted the focus group discussion with the participants uh, of the healing ceremony. So one of the uh, questions uh, was uh, how this healing ceremony was benefited uh, you. So that times we find some responses. So some of the responses I like to share with you. Uh, it's like I can count on others, and I can understand my family and community are with me. I'm not alone. So it means that uh, this healing ceremony actually increases the sense of belongingness. And there is another comments comes from the uh, women, the female. Uh, I could feel that we can be better. We have each others. So actually from this statement and the healing ceremony has a positive role in the, uh, the women's uh, life. They can understand their contributions. They can realize that they have value in their community. And we also found some uh, another things like that we felt hopeless because we felt we had nothing. But in the end, we realized that we had music and we had a neighbor sitting to us. Actually, it explained uh, that we, the healing series focus on the positive aspects and the resources, which make them feel uh, less hopeless. So I want to acknowledge uh, So I, I, I want to acknowledge uh, which actually without their support, this work was not completed or it's not was done the Rohingya community who actually helped to develop these articles and the team which is actually working in Cox Bazaar in SPSSP, IOM, and the last but not least, the most important persons uh, in our program, the Solga Rupaldo, yeah, which are a previous supervisor. Thank you all. So if you have any questions. Thank you, Salik. Um, hold on right there for a moment. Uh, we do have a number of questions from colleagues uh, in the chat box, but I'd just like to ask just one of them now, just before, while we still have you on, um, which is how did you or the rest of your colleagues identify healing ceremonies as the most effective or culturally sensitive or appropriate way to address psychosocial issues for this community? If you just give us a, a brief response to that, uh, we will take the rest of the questions later. How so did you identify you, the appropriate approach? How can you identify that this is actually we the, the healing ceremony designed with the consultation of the, the community. So it's not the our approach. So totally community uh, based on their feedback and based on their suggestions, the healing ceremony was designed and implementing. It's actually the pilot project. So we always take the uh, feedback from the community and based on the feedback, we also do these things. Thank you, Salik. I think we will want to hear a bit more about the detail of how you did those consultations. But uh, for now, we're going to shift from um, from uh, Cox's Bazaar to our colleague who is joining us uh, um, from Nairobi, I believe, Sahir. Um, let me just get your um, presentation up on the board uh, and we're going to switch over to your microphone.
Shire, are you there? Yes, Ananda, I'm here. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. I'm trying to make sure that we have your your presentation up. Okay, um, great. Moment, there we go. It's it'll be up in a second. So go wonderful. Cat, take All it right. away. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from over, all over the world. Uh, my name is Shair Dahabu Ibrahim. I have been working with DCA in Bangladesh um, from 2018, uh, June. I want to talk more about the role of psychosocial support in coping with incidents of gender-based violence among the Rohingya refugees and how the programming has been. So the, 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 the way the presentation is structured, we'll talk more about the introduction, which some of my colleagues have mentioned about Bangladesh, but I'll just go briefly over it. And then how did we come about uh, these uh, field reports? What was the design, the methodology that we used and the approach, and most importantly, about on the conclusion? I will go directly first. When we need to understand what gender-based violence is, uh, gender-based violence, it's um, any harmful act that is perpetrated against someone's will. And we want to know more about an emergency. For instance, in 2018, as my colleagues have said, we saw massive number of people coming from uh, Myanmar crossing over to Bangladesh. A lot of these people have had incidents of gender-based violence um, uh, happening to them or a person they know or a family member. And it's a life-threatening, it's a global health issue, and uh, it's a human rights issue as well. We know that in an emergency, the risk of violence, exploitation, and abuse is, uh, is heightened, especially for women and girls. This is because there is breakdown on community and maybe family support units that existing. There is changes in the structure um, of the social norms, there's also the physical change of environment. You're going to a new place, so there is a lot of changes that happens. We also see that many gender-based violence, they have long-lasting psychological and social effects. And the impact of GBV then varies from person to person. So we can't say that maybe the same, the same situation has happened to one person, the coping um, mechanism for these people will be different because the impact of GBV is different for in each individual. Looking at what uh, Dan Church Aid has done in the Rohingya refugee camp, Dan Church Aid started its operation in the September 20, um, 2017 after the impact has started previously was working with the, a national organization on the ground and looking at the extent of the, of the emergency, they had to now get in and uh, start operation in providing services to people who are in need. And one of the services that was really needed at the moment was gender-based violence programming, uh, which included both response and prevention. Um, we had different uh, uh, different ways of dealing with uh, the GBV programming, and this is more on prevention aspect and the response aspect. And one of the main factors that we've seen immediately after coming uh, to do direct implementation was the need to have women and girls safe spaces that are specific to women who will come and get assistance on gender-based violence. We also had the aspect of uh, life skills development, uh, a lot of capacity building, uh, intervention, risk mitigation through safety audits to see which are the areas that, uh, that uh, require support and also linking up with other actors. This year also recognizes that PSS in the GBV programming is also an essential complement to services provided by other actors in order to meet the 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 needs of the women and girls in a holistic in a holistic manner so some of the um, responses at the women and girls safe spaces include the case management where this is a structured method of providing help to a survivor that is provided by uh, trained case workers 
and it's a whole process that then leads to uh, to make decision and which again is followed in a coordinated way with other actors. So why did we see the PSS as very important um, in the programming? One, because it prevents distress. These people have been have undergone a lot of trauma, I would say, and stress back in their country during flight and back uh, within Bangladesh once they came came in in the camps. So they will need to develop something that uh, uh, to actually uh, bring uh, uh, support uh, to people so that they can cope better and uh, are able to reconcile with everyday reality. And also we wanted to see that people are able to resume their normal lives. If you look at the case studies that are presented in the article, it actually shows the way uh, people, the, the incidences of GBV affected the normal lives of people. And uh, the last point I will say is in order to meet the basic needs of uh, the people we are serving. So just to come uh, back to um, the first case study, if uh, you look at the situation of uh, the woman who, uh, is, um, who is actually sharing her story, uh, basically we have been collecting information on a regular basis in terms of focus group discussion so that we can improve uh, programming and also identify areas where we can collaborate further with other actors as well as also improve our own prevention uh, strategies within the organization. One of the things, uh, the, the approaches, uh, the method we used was more of collecting information through group uh, discussions. And then from these group discussions, then we can have individual um, interviews. And the cases that are written uh, in this, um, in this uh, intervention journal, was not specifically for the journal, but this was something that we've been doing regularly uh, so that it can help us. So we were able to get two case studies for people who were willing to share their stories with the, the world at large. And the first case study is about the sexual violence. This is a woman who uh, is about 30 years old. Her husband was abducted uh, back in her home country. Uh, she witnessed a lot of killings and dead bodies on the way. She lost her son. Um, she had to come to Bangladesh uh, through the using the river, crossing the river. She was actually sexually assaulted when she came uh, to the to the to Bangladesh, and um, she had she was unable to trust everyone around her. We are also seeing the fact that looking at the mental um, health pyramid. Her status as a single mother has put her in um, in a in a situation whereby we need. She was not only isolated but found it difficult to build a relationship due to the emotional and psychological effect of her experiences. Uh, what we are seeing here from her story is that the aspect of trust, sharing information with anybody, is still a challenge with many of the women who have undergone incidents of gender-based violence. We are also seeing that building relationship with other actors, proper coordination, ensuring the referral pathways uh, is functional is also an aspect that um, can be used to increase uh, the aspect. Uh, the types of uh, PSS activities that she benefited from is the community and family support, the aspect of stressing and reunification, at least she was able to find her son. At the emotional support, where we have uh, counselors counselor, and psychosocial counselors at the women and girls safe spaces that have been trained and are able to even uh, refer cases uh, that require further assistance. We employ also different relaxation sessions like breathing, which is uh, the, the long, uh, slow breath, the body scan, the guided imagery, mediation, and prayers. Identification also of positive coping mechanisms and then participated in different GBV awareness sessions, life skills and education. And what we came to see from her testimony is that she previously found it difficult to talk to other women, even at the center. But now she feels more relaxed, comfortable and confident in taking uh, and talking to other women. The second one is about um, um, 
a 21 year old uh, woman who has seen her brother and her husband uh, all of them her brother been killed her husband in time but she can't recall what happened to her husband she that she was unable to remember exactly at that point she was pregnant and she had a son she had to flee and come back um, to bangladesh and within the camps again there was the aspect of as a single woman with no mail uh, and no clothing like burqa and umbrella find it very difficult for her to move around, especially if you don't have a male um, family or a person to accompany you around. As well as adapting to the new environment and the general safety concerns in the camps had made um, a bit uh, difficult for her. What we are seeing here is the emotional support um, that is provided by the caseworkers, still individual counseling, relaxation session, recreational activities that are providing. We have cooking sessions, uh, sewing and so on, and then tailoring and handcraft. The outcome here, we see that now she believes uh, this activity have helped her to build a better uh, life for her and her children. She's determined that she is now able to make her own decision and take care of herself and her children. Uh, finally, when we come to conclusion, and most of the time I will go back to our intervention on the um, intervention pyramid on mental health and psychosocial support in emergency, where we will look at different layers and how these uh, layers interact with our, our, our work. The first one we'll look at, the first two um, layers is about the community focused PSS which we actually see that it seek, it identif we, we seek to identify the needs as well as a, we need to protect uh, the past, the dignity, and pro uh, promote the well-being of them, and ensuring that the stigma and um, stigma and the negative consequences are prevented from from the start. The other two aspects we see is more of a person-focused intervention. There is the need for us to build capacity of even the staff that are providing uh, support, uh, build. Uh, more relationship with the women and girls that are coming to the safe space and developing trust and, and ensuring all the services are provided to everyone. And then there is the aspect of uh, the trainings needs to be participatory so that everybody around the women, the staff are able to understand the process and procedures that are involved. And then we know that in GBB itself, psychosocial support is a crucial element of a coordinated GBV response. You cannot do GBV response without considering uh, uh, psychosocial support. And then we have the aspect of both the community and the individualized approach, which results to holistic uh, healing. Awareness of the community's presence as possible influence during implementation. As, as you do implementation of uh, the GBV programming, then there is need for the community to understand the whole process from the start. So it's not an organization standalone program, but a, co a participation of all the communities involved in order to understand what is happening, what's a, what is GBV itself. And then we should also consider having a range of psychosocial support um, activities can, that are functioning um, in the program. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Thank you, Shire. I'm going to um, just um, perhaps uh, save your questions. Um, there have been several questions for you okay. for the, the question and answer session, but perhaps before you go, just to ask how you, how you came to identify PSS as being a key uh, component for the intervention around GBV? Okay, what we know that um, PSS, when you look at the PSS approach, it actually looks at the individual in the context of a combined influence that is psychological factors and the surrounding social environment. So we cannot work with an individual without looking at them and the environment they live in. That makes so that they can be able to function well and that is the reason why it's very important to look at PSS as in a coordinated manner and as, a, as a, an essential um, part on GBV programming. So PSS in some ways is a sort of a platform, a 
or the or the the point of entry into engaging with uh, survivors of GBV? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I will say it can be yes. Uh, at the same time, no. When I'm talking about yes, because this individual that has come to you or this individual that is seeking service from you, of course, comes, if you look at the layers again, I'll go back to the pyramids, the psychosocial, we have to look at the needs of the person. We have to look at the community and the support. So we have to look at the general person, what are the needs they have? And we have to look at the, the, the community and the family support that they have, because you cannot uh, exclude the person from the community they live in. So it is a very, very important component that needs to be considered from the start of the program. For, for thank staff, you very much. Okay, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry to cut you off. But thank okay. you so much. I mean, I think we, we have many questions for you. Okay. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm going to switch back now to, uh, to Cox's Bazaar, uh, where Mahmoudul Alam is going to tell us a bit about the, the role of community psychosocial volunteers in the MHPSS response. Thanks, Ananda, to introduce me. And hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to you are listen to me. Uh, I'm Mahmoud Alam from UNICEF Public Health Team. Now I'm going to highlight the um, my presentation that community engagement in mental health and psychosocial support. Example from the Rohingya refugee response. In my presentation, I will explain, I will, I will share the couple of issues like the community engagement, both community psychosocial volunteer, uh, their supervision, monitoring, and also especially I will share one article written by our colleague and uh, community psychosocial volunteer, yes, Arafat, and also Hasna Tashumi. So I think uh, this whole thing I will just share in my presentation. Yeah, so when we are looking about this component, uh, uh, community engagement, and also in our our MSPSS program in UNICEF uh, psychosocial programming, if if we look at uh, when we are looking at this uh, community, then community uh, community support and community needs, mostly uh, we are focusing like um, uh, community. Uh, Community level support, then hello, then structure and structure support and specialized support. So when we programming, when we develop our uh, program, MSPS program in UNICEF, we focus like five five steps in our uh, in our care models. Mm -hmm. Like if we, if you look at the MSPSS programming, is it's mostly the cross cutting issue, you know. So it it is some is the protection and also public health. So. Our volunteer is in the community people is working in protection programming and also health program. So that's why when we are develop our program, then we mostly focus the five steps. So if you look at, uh, you are looking the present, when you are looking my presentation, you, you easily can go through this. The last part, the in the bottom, there will be the community health worker and community mm -hmm. outreach member. Community health worker mostly the uh, primary healthcare setting and community outreach member mostly the uh, the GBB center, safe space, so mostly the community based uh, um, uh, program and you can say the community based facilities. These community out uh, health worker and community outreach member mostly they are uh, community people and also working to the uh, community uh, in terms of uh, in terms of to fill up the need of the community. Sometimes they are working in the community, they are identifying the cases, they refer to the cases. But when we are particularly talking about our uh, community engagement in terms um, in the perspective of the MSPSS programming. Mostly, we are focusing the community psychosocial volunteer. So, community psychosocial volunteer mostly carrying the uh, psychosocial component and mental health issue in our programming. So, if we so you you can you can see in in the picture in the in the right side like is our community psychosocial volunteer with our MSPSS team of UNICEF and also partner uh, partner staffs. So is, 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 is the last year picture, like uh, we, we celebrate the World Mental Health uh, Day together in October. So when we are talking, when I'm talking about this UNICEF care model, so 
in the bottom the community health work and community psychosocial volunteer when they found some MSPSS cases so they referred these cases to the community psychosocial volunteer and this community psychosocial volunteer sometimes include them in their programming like the community workshop and peer support activities some cases they refer if they feel if this uh, case, this case needs some specialized support or maybe need some psychological support in-depth psychological support that time they directly refer to the lay counselor or psychologist sometimes they refer to the ms gap trained doctor and yeah. I mean, ms gap trained doctor sometimes refer to the psychiatric doctor it, it's happened also sometimes is the vice versa like psychiatric doctor sent to the community psychosocial volunteer is is mean the through proper channel mm -hmm. and when we are looking in the right side there there is also you can look at the different sector like information point community child a child protection field team hgbb team nutrition field team and also education stuff so in their program there is also lots of psychosocial issues sometimes they refer cases directly to the community psychosocial volunteer so is the is the question is mostly coming with who are the community psychosocial volunteer mm -hmm. so from my perspective and when we work with the community psychosocial volunteer anyone can be a community any anyone could be a community psychosocial volunteer who are the part of the community in is in the rohingya community but when we uh, talking about our community psychosocial volunteer we set some criteria for them so uh, we we select a uh, community uh, community people for our programming purpose we choose like uh, you already mohammed and also mohammed shared that uh, in his presentation this community education level is here the highly highly poor literacy so when we're looking the community psychosocial but also we choose like educated person but in reality mostly the higher educated here the highest education level is like 10 grade so some of the our community psychosocial volunteers is 10 grade like in female summer is four or five grade in five grade in their school they just complete the school and they didn't get the opportunity to access the education level so mostly when we categorize our community psychosocial volunteer in terms of education they are mostly 10 grade is 18 18 to 15 and if we when we, when we are talking about the their language mostly they are used in the, their own dialogue is in the rohingya dialogue some are used in the chitarang dialogue and also some people know the english and some we can also bengali because we know that it's very uh, mixed refugee like some refugee come is 1992 they are staying here so then very well in bengali some are very uh, good in english and in our team both is considered like male and female so when we are talking about this community engagement so mostly come uh, mostly the coming the point the community engagement hot types of engagement is ongoing so mostly i will say that this community engagement is is a small a community workshop you can, you can say is a small community meeting it sometimes is three hours so this community psychosocial volunteer offered this meeting to the community so community people participate this meeting they can they can share their um, their their suffering they can share their good uh, good 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 and yeah, good good info uh, good uh, positive history sometimes they can gossip sometimes they make fun and and also sometimes they they can seek support from the each other so this way this community workshop is to of course we have a specific curriculum for this community workshop then i will go in the i will just go a little bit about this one in the in my next slide so when also very important when these community psychosocial volunteers run the community workshop they mostly focus some specific topic is 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 also I, I will say it's very structural way they will be running the community workshop then i say already i said is three hour meeting so like mostly our committee psychosocial volunteer is run this workshop some based on some topic like this of mind journey of life anger management better parenting children in community workshop so when we are looking at this workshop mostly this workshop is three part first part mostly they will reach the community people talk about the rules of the meeting is the, the workshop and also some issue of the confidentiality how much time they need to run to complete this meeting and also the as in about the meeting 
until part mostly the the mid the the inner the main part of the core part of this workshop and the in the last phase mostly we talk about the we, we receive that we take the feedback from the community really this workshop is very effective or not maybe is the sometimes they feel is and and also others so really is the time is convenient or not and also sometimes we talk about the next meeting also when it will be take place and also we talk about regarding the venue also. so that the important part is when we're talking about this community engagement our curriculum and also when we develop no when we build a capacity of our community psychosocial volunteer uh, we also keep our mind about the core mspss principles because it's not like our thought just we impose to the community and community just go with this so if we go through the if we go through the core mspss principles then i then i will just give some i i will just add some little example then i think it will be um, more understandable to the participant like if i go to the human rights and equity then this uh, then i will i will give the example like the committee psychosocial volunteer uh, make the build uh, to the facility uh, I, I will say the meaningful access to the um, facility for the community so is when the community can easily can um, can can come to the facility with the uh, with support of the uh, community psychosocial volunteer and when we are talking about that like the code means for the participation when we develop curriculum for the um, community workshop mostly we meet with the community we consult with the community we interview the uh, uh, focal person of the community like the leader religious leader imam and the community people they, they share their opinion they like i shared this like six topic like peace of mind journey of life this is not our topic is 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 the feedback of the community so community give this uh, the topics that they want to learn from us and they want to uh, they want to listen from us so that's why we develop these uh, workshop topics and if you go to multi layer support now already this already i in care practice unicier care model ms spaces program already i shared that this community sector social volunteer are engaged in the all layers and if i go to the building available resource and capacity mostly we choose the community people so this volunteer mostly the community people we build up their capacity indicator support system now this community social volunteer and link is the informal formal it both support system if you go to, um, if you look at the community they are also connected with the community at the same time they are also link with the uh, all types of facility of the and then is the supervision and monitoring and also when we are talking about the no or do no harm then also we are in monitoring we are regular basically giving the supervision and when we are talking when we also develop their curriculum um according to their culture is we also do the culture adaptation so this this um this is the article i i i talk at the beginning of the uh, my presentation this this uh, the photo you saw the male he's the uh, arafat arafat is a community sexual volunteer uh, living in the camp for and so he wrote article with my with my colleague has not shown me just i'm just sharing the key point of this uh, article uh, in article he talks many things when i go through this one just i part i i think i will just give a small introduction then i will go uh, go 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 forward look arafat displaced from the myanmar to bangladesh is 2017 he come here with her with his family he's living in the camp for with mother and also sister uh, he also experienced with um, violence in the Myanmar, and also he, in, he also experienced the burning of the, his village. And when he first uh, came in 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 Cox Bazar, firstly he uh, he learned like this communication is like he learned it's very difficult for to communicate with others in others a country. So. He he and at the same time he also distress he has lots of psychosocial distress um, being this uh, tortured by this uh, Myanmar army and at the same time in her family her mother and also others also psychosocial distress so this program help her to help him 
to learn about the MSPS's mental health and psychosocial issue and also he learned how to cope this and at the same time he also, also helped her mother to how to get out from the psychosocial distress. When he received lots of training from the MSPS's um, training and also he go forward to the community and go to the community he also faced lots of challenges to arrange the community workshop is when the community workshop in the community level he took lots of he in in, in this article he also talked about the um, community reluctant sometimes the male participant and female participant reluctant to attend this community workshop sometimes in the meeting they are totally silent they are they are, they are not response sometimes they do not accept the uh, leadership of the community psychosocial volunteer. In, it's been like sometimes the community psychosocial volunteer is very young, like 22, 23, but the participant is like 50. So sometimes they do not accept their leadership. At the same time, is now this program is one year and a half. We have also very good uh, acknowledgement. Also, we receive very good acknowledgement from the community. Now community learn from this program about the mental health psychosocial support. They accept our this program and also sometimes they also request to the community psychosocial volunteer to arrange the community workshop and invite them to attend this uh, attend the meeting so i think is like challenges and acknowledgement from community so i will just i will just briefly go to the uh, training curriculum so mostly when we work this common with the psychosocial volunteer we develop a tra training curriculum for the community psychosocial volunteer just i will I'll give you a small short brief like we provide the uh, skill training communication skill training to the psychosocial group facilitation skill training at the same time so we also give the training on psychosocial psychological first aid identification referral instances do and also do and don't what they can do and what they can don't and also self-care so they can take care of this one and also we provide the training on uh, community workshops already i shared the community workshop and so so then supervision monitoring and reporting i think is very important part so supervision mostly these committee psychosocial volunteer are not directly uh, receive uh administrative support from the unicr mostly they are the unicr partner team so they have their own supervisor but in the unicr technical team and also they are super we are closely working together we have very professional relation with this committee psychosocial volunteer so regular basis we are maintaining this portion release and maintaining these uh, providing the supervision we are maintaining the routine tasks for their uh, routine uh, maintaining the routine tasks we are we are following their routine tasks regular basis and we are monitoring their works and reporting we are taking their report from daily basis weekly and also monthly it's very like a small like, um, report then when we're looking at this impact is we have lots of people in impact of this program like when we, we put this community soldier to the um, community is mean they are very good bridge for us like in 2018 translation with border without border they published an article and they in in their article the main thing was like 62 percent humanity and worker could not uh, communicate with the refugee community so it's a very good build improve the referral process now it's well established and also the access to uh, access the community to the facility then we, still we have a lot of challenges this committee engagement men women participation regarding men women participant and already i shared the age gap because sometimes the volunteer very young then community people are elder people cannot accept their leadership in my conclusion i will say i think thank thank you all to listen to me i hope it it, it is interesting and if you have any question to me just share with me Thank you so much, Mahmoudul. <clears throat> Just before we let you go and we turn to some of the other presenters with the questions we've got, I'd just like to put one question which comes from Sirar in Bahrain. Um, and uh, Sirar asks, says, during their group sessions in the community, um, I reckon there may be challenges with regards to group community sessions in, in the group community sessions with regarding sharing uh, personal stories or struggles is this an issue they face and how do they address it generally yeah uh, already because i shared the when they, yeah. Yeah. Uh, already i shared when they run the community workshop there is there is some specific rule for the community workshop then there is a one rule like the confidentiality so in it is the two part you know? is the two part from like in the, in the group 
someone share their own inner experience, own, own hidden experience, then community can spread, community is when the participant can spread and the other people. And the other part is the like community psychosocial volunteer. Community psychosocial volunteer, they have clear, uh, they have the, they have received the training also regular basis. We are monitoring the community people. So in group, we always encourage the people if really something is very bad, so don't share like the very publicly, then just communicate with the community psychosocial volunteers so they will take care. It means they can refer to the right places. So this way we are working. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so let me now just um, step back for a moment and, and uh, say that we've got had a number of different questions from uh, uh, participants uh, to the various presenters. We have about 15 minutes left for the discussion. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, move from one uh, presenter to the other uh, with some of the key questions. What's been really nice is that as you've been asking questions, in some cases, presenters like Mahmoudul actually answered many of the questions that were put to him. So, uh, or, you know, in his presentation itself. So I'm going to just switch over. Um, perhaps, Chair, you'd like to also just um, un you know, online, uh, and I'd like to, um, you know, uh, perhaps uh, share with you a couple of questions that came to you. Um, yeah. So one question from Ruth uh, in Ireland was, um, she said, you know, I'd be interested to know how, how know about how participation in the SGBV program was perceived by the community, and if you did anything to mitigate positive possible stigmatization. Now, you actually did mention the issue of stigma and, and the importance of addressing it, but perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on how you navigated or mitigate, mitigated the risks of this for the okay. women accessing service. Yes. Thank you very much for your question, Ruth. It's actually a very good question. Looking at the perception of community, this is actually, uh, especially during an emergency, it's actually very difficult for people to see GBV as a, as a real problem because people are looking for basic services, they're looking for food and things like that. So how did we mitigate the risk of stigmatization in this case is involving everybody, including men and boys, in discussions about gender-based violence. What are the types of gender-based violence? Having specific, for example, there is this uh, module that IRC has developed that talks about engaging men and boys in accountable practice. So looking at people who can support uh, in the prevention and the fight against gender-based violence, working with religious leaders, actually involving them, working with all actors in the camp, providing uh, uh, training to people. However, stigma is not something that will go in three years' time because this emergency has been here from the, the, the majority of people fled uh, in 2017. So we can't say that the aspect of stigma has already gone completely, but there are efforts that have been put in place to ensure that at least people are able to come and to the women and girls safe spaces and get support uh, from actors, as well as also being able to be referred to other actors. Because when we see at the Rohingya women and girls, majority of them did not seek services even back in their countries. They will keep to themselves. Looking at how best then can we uh, talk to them or can we reach them wherever they are so that they can come to facilities or even refer them? And if you look at the article we wrote, we talked about the aspect of um, um, survivor satisfaction that we did survey to just see from the people that we have served, how, how are the services that we are providing? Is it on the case management part? And we are seeing that survivors actually feel comfortable if the case worker that was handling their case accompanies them to a certain service provider that they need services. These are some of the things that we are looking into. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Thank you, Chair. That that is really helpful. Um, you mentioned um, when you in your response uh, engagement with men and Sylvia, um, right, uh, who's joining us from Germany, has has asked a question about um, male survivors of sexual violence, um, yeah. saying that you know, that that we know that there are many in in the context uh, of the Rohingya population in Bangladesh, and she was wondering whether you were also working with male survivors, and if so, how one would adapt programs there, um, and uh, particularly you. around issues of stigma and, and a sort of a hard to talk about topic there. 
Uh, thank you very much um, for that question. What I will say is uh, we, as my organization, we are currently dealing with women and girls safe spaces, specifically for women and girls. However, it doesn't mean that any survivor that comes our way, we are not going to provide services to them. We have linked up with other actors in the camps that are providing services to men and boys, directly to men and boys. So once we receive such cases, which we have received through our outreach interventions, through our mobile teams, uh, through trainings in the community, you just someone after the training, you talk about these things, they come and approach uh, the facilitator. And once all this is done, then we refer to the actor that is providing the services. The referral pathways are there, but still it's extremely difficult for men and boys to come up because of the culture and the existing norm and of course the stigma that exists. But once they come, of course, that is a must. We have to provide services to everyone who's in need. Thank you, Shire. I'd like to um, go back to the, the, the team in, in Cox's Bazaar and specifically um, share a couple of questions that were put forward to Salik. Uh, Yuko, connecting from Japan, um, asks about uh, how participants uh, join. Do they self-select? What attracts them to come to healing? Um, she also asks, uh, how do you make participants feel safe to express themselves? Um, how many times do they have to come together before they feel comfortable with each other? And importantly, what happens when a conflict arises inside the group? Yeah, thank you for Sally? the questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, you listen to me? Yes, Hello. we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we did the uh, awareness sessions and in the community levels by our the community support uh, volunteers, and through these awareness sessions, uh, we shared our the spaces service and all uh, all all of the service actually the clinical base and the community based service. So based on the uh, service uh, the information we share, so that some people are come to us. And someone identify our the community volunteer. So based on these things, we actually select the participants. But uh, this is open for all. Uh, anybody can join uh, if they are feeling interested or if they have any problems. Okay. What was the second question? The second one is how 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 long does it? How many times do people have to meet before they start to feel comfortable with each other? And also. What happens if there's a conflict in the group between some members? Well, actually, uh, this is session three times, and uh, most of the participants attend in three sessions. And and they are able to feel comfortable and relax and participate fully from the first session, or does it take some time? Actually, uh, before doing the healing session, we do some activities with them, so it can, makes them feel comfortable. And this session actually is run by the senior counselor, who is psychologist and the social worker. So they are skilled enough to deal with this type of uh, issues. Okay. And and do you have, have you had any experience where people have um, had some disagreement, maybe about the ritual, maybe about something else? within the group between the participants yeah we have the uh, same experience what you mentioned uh, but uh, before starting the sessions we already shared the ground rules of the sessions and when we uh, find these issues then we uh, remind them that this is the issue so there was no right and wrong answer so through this way we mitigate this uh, crisis and we okay. also discuss visually actually after the sessions Okay, thank you, Salik. There was one other question also from Gabriel, uh, who's connecting from Gibraltar, who was saying, you know, were the healing ceremonies separate for men and for women's groups? And Sirad from Bahrain was also asking whether they were only for adults or whether you had anything similar for traditional women. So I didn't listen care, uh, properly. Can you repeat? Can you repeat? So, so first question is, is it men and women separately or together? Yes. And, and the second question is, what about children? Okay, the children group is a mixed group actually. And the adult male, female are separate group. 
and the children do you mix age groups yeah because we have the contact the sessions with the below 12 it's a mixed group and uh, above 12 it's a separated group okay thank you very much um, salik i'm i have a question also um for um for muhammad um um who do who connecting from cameroon said um i have noticed that there is only one psychiatrist for 3.5 million people how do mm -hmm. you manage the medical conditions like psychosis severe depression in this context so how do you respond to a uh, a large population both refugee and beyond with very mm -hmm. limited mental health uh, professionals well there are many many strategies to deal with this uh, first of all we need we work to push the service to the lowest possible level of care so we we try to avoid the medicalization uh, of the, the the psychosocial problems so not every single case with a mental health concern should be referred to the psychiatrist to avoid overwhelming them. And also the second one or the second approach is uh, the task shifting. So we work to integrate mental health and primary health care. And in that sense, we train primary health care doctors on how to assist and manage mental health condition. In that sense, there is a slight shift in the role of the psychiatrist from direct clinical service provision more to capacity building activity. Okay. Does it and then, yes, I I think so. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a okay. huge question, but I think that was a succinct answer. I I wonder. There was another question about the challenges you mentioned about um, the language barriers and the lack of written language. And um, there was a question from Mania, who's connecting from um, Santa Cruz in California, about how you've manage to or attempt to overcome that barrier and what what that looks like uh, at the community level well it's well this one actually is one of the very challenging um uh, challenges yeah so it's it's a tough one i think number one i assume it has been sorted out naturally by time so um uh, national colleagues who have been working in this context for years especially over the last two years they have learned the language of refugees and we are able to communicate with them well. So this is one, I would say this is the strongest factor. The second one, we developed a glossary of terms of, of uh, uh, which, which I mean, um, the idioms of distress, the Rohingya idioms of distress, and we, we disseminated this among different uh, field staff so they, they could know the terms that they can use in communication about image base as with when with refugees the third one which is a very important is m much of our activities uh, uh rely on the community volunteers from the rohingya from the rohingya community which would help us to bridge the gap the existing gap in the language culture and communication with uh, uh with the community thanks very much um, there were some questions that came um, from some colleagues also who were struggling to get through uh, around the, the the role for specialized intervention, specialized psychological therapies, um, uh, whether it was EMDR or, or uh, uh, interpersonal um, adapt therapy and other clinical approaches. Could you tell us a little bit about how those are being developed or, or adapted for this kind of context? Well, um, uh, uh, let me start first with, with the scalable psychological interventions, because there have been many efforts to pilot some of these interventions here, and most of the pilots are very successful. So the IBT, the group IBT, and the IET, and recently, not recently, I mean last year, uh tdh as well the uh, part of the pm the pm plus so uh, i would say that scalable psychological interventions found good uh, perception and appreciation by both the community and by the service providers because still you can uh, provide a structured uh, psychological intervention that's brief trans diagnostic very sensitive but less specific and can be delivered by non-specialized people when there is a system for training and supervision. I would say it, it has a, a, like a, a more, more uh, impact or value when compared to the classic psychotherapy. Classic 
or, or the traditional trauma focused therapies, they still they exist on a smaller scale. Um, but we always we, we we advocate to look more into the community healing mechanisms rather than focusing on uh, or or directing resources to trauma focused therapies. They still they exist, but on a smaller scale. A smaller scale compared to community-based interventions. Thanks. That's very interesting, Mohammed. Maybe um, just we're coming to the, the the close of the session, but maybe just uh, a question to you, but also to the other colleagues around what some of the key factors have been in um, adapting approaches that perhaps were not present either in 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 this context for some of the service providers or or that were unfamiliar to the, um, the affected population. What were some of the key considerations and factors uh, that you had to take into account in adapting those to make them uh, acceptable and, and effective in that context? Well, I, I think this is very important, uh, Ananda, and not just here, it's like everywhere, of, of the starting point. And I think as, as Salik mentioned and as Mahmoud mentioned later, we start from the community. So even for the for the psychological interventions that have been rolled out over the last few years, we go first to the community and we discuss and we consult them. And we try to, to look into the very micro components and see if they are culturally appropriate or need more adaptation or not. I'm not saying it's an easy or straightforward process, but we, we start plainly with, with consultation with the community and we keep an open mechanism to receive feedback from the community about each and every single one of, of these interventions to make sure that we 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 provide what what's culturally appropriate. But generally speaking, I would say we we have, um, and I think this is a global issue. We 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 we, uh, we lack an evidence about um, interventions or a framework of intervention that can help to improve the cultural competence of mental health. Uh, uh, programs in emergencies and I think m more or less the efforts that are generated here or there are individual ones there are but they may include components related to working closely with the community involving community volunteers to bridge this cultural gap but so far we don't have a very strong empirical evidence supporting all all these activities thanks very much uh, Mohammed uh, on that note uh, and perhaps with a topic for a future webinar, I would like to um, to bring this slightly extended uh, webinar to a close. Uh, I would like to invite everyone who's participated to take our uh, exit survey, which is just a few questions to give us some feedback on the session and, and um, let us know how we can follow up or improve on this. Um, going forward, I would like to um, express our deep uh, appreciation of the presenters, um, uh, Mohammed, Salek, um, Shaya, uh, and Mahmoudul for um, really keeping us uh, keeping us uh, interested and and gi giving us a taste of what is contained in that um, 28 article bumper edition of intervention. So I strongly recommend that you check that out. Um, and and thank you again to the the uh, the the team at intervention um, who have uh, uh, have put this together and who uh, for for bringing us this uh, this great webinar. Um, thanks uh, thanks to everyone uh, and please do take the survey uh, and we will uh, be posting if we can some of the presentations on mhpss.net with the permission of the uh, presenters. And if the presenters are willing to also share, we had some inquiries about whether they'd be willing to share their email addresses for uh, for follow up. If they are willing, I will ask them to put that uh, either posted in the chat box right now or to include that in the um, PowerPoints that they will be uploading on mhpss.net. Thanks, thanks again to everyone who for participating, and uh, we will be posting the uh, the recording also on our YouTube channel. So you revisit it. Thanks a lot, Aranda, and thanks everyone. Greetings from Cox Bazaar, and uh, I'm sharing my email. Happy to receive any communication uh, related to this webinar topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.